I, I think I, I'm going to focus in a little bit on the agriculture side, but before we do that, and I suppose my, my brief was just to, to look back over the whole development of this and uh, I suppose the, the question maybe, how do we get here? How is it that on a the afternoon, a uh, Tuesday afternoon in January, uh, you can fill a room here in the middle of Dublin with people from the agriculture community or people that are interested in, in agricultural issues uh, around a topic like climate change. So what, 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 what has been the journey uh, to get here? And I suppose it started maybe with this, and this is a, a graph that goes back over nearly a million years, and it shows uh, CO2 uh, concentrations in the, in the atmosphere. And it's a very obviously truncated scale. So when we look at the, the, the very right-hand side of the graph, you know, and we see that uh, in the last 50 years or so, uh, CO2 emissions have really gone to a level uh, which is beyond anything that we have seen in the previous million years or so. I suppose it was that development or that rising concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere that uh, started scientists to think about what were the implications of the previous century's growth in the, the burning of fossil fuels. That Concern uh, being voiced by scientists as to the implications of this uh, change in our atmosphere. You know, there was obviously a lot of discussion and scientific debate about that, but the first big event was the, what, was often, what is often called the Earth Summit, which took place in Rio de Janeiro um, almost 30 years ago at this stage. And that was a United, Nation, uh, United Nations organised summit, and the purpose, purpose of it was to create a platform to allow countries to cooperate together on environmental and development issues, including uh, climate change. And it recognised the, the, the point that John was making that, you know, there's kind of no, no policeman in, in all of this. Like, this, this uh, requires countries to volunteer to work together uh, to try, try to solve issues like, like climate change. So that was the idea, to create a platform to allow countries to cooperate on this issue. And one of the big outputs, or the first big output, I suppose, from from that uh, platform uh, was a treaty called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, a big long name uh, abbreviated to UNFCCC or UNFCCC. And that treaty was open for signing uh, at the conference in Rio in 1992 and it came into force uh, two years later in 1994. And point uh, maybe just to make about this is, you know, this area moves slowly. You're talking about building consensus among countries. So even though there had been an awful lot of preparation work done in this treaty and it was open for signature in 1992, it took another two years really to get enough countries uh, signed up to it. The objective was to stabilize greenhouse gas uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. And at the time in 1994, when it came into, or uh, sorry, currently, there are 197 uh, countries in the world or what they're called parties uh, who have signed up to that, uh, that treaty. And every year since 1995, there's a major conference held, which is called a Conference of the Parties, or a Conference of the Countries that have signed up to, to this treaty. It's called the COP, so you'll hear this in the news every so often, at the COP meeting here, or the COP meeting there. The last uh, COP meeting was in Madrid uh, last um, November, I think, and uh, the next COP meeting is actually in Glasgow in uh, next November. So these, these are big meetings where all the countries come together and usually you hear, you know, the talks are breaking down or the talks are going nowhere, the talks are extended, uh, there's going to be a, a, an agreement and eventually some kind of a, a communication comes out of the, the meeting uh, reaffirming the, the commitment of the countries to, to address uh, this issue and, you know, no sooner has the, the the ink wouldn't have dried on it before it's been criticised by some people as not too weak and others by too others as being too strong and so on. Anyway, that, that's what it is. The next big thing that came out of the, um, this UNFCCC was the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, this is probably familiar uh, to all of you. Uh, it was adopted in 1997. Look how long that took to come into force, uh, another eight years. It has been ratified by 184 of the, the parties, or 184 countries. And the Kyoto Protocol placed legally binding obligations on the, the people that signed it, uh, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And um, there were two commitment periods. There was the period to 2008 to 2012, and Ireland, among, uh, with, with many other countries, had a target to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990 as the base year over that period. And then the second commitment period started, which was for the period 2013 to 2020. So we're still in that second commitment period 
of Kyoto. We're in the last year of it, and um, our emissions reduction target is compared to a base year of 2005 uh, for, for, for this period. The next big event along this roadmap or this journey has been the 2015 Paris Agreement. And the aim of this was to keep temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius and to go further than, that was the absolute max, but to go further and try to keep it below 1.5 degrees. <coughs> so this uh, agreement also referenced adaptation to climate change, recognising that you know, we, we already have had uh, a rise in temperatures and we may not be able to reach that 1.5 degree target and so on. So it recognised adaptation, as, as John outlined in his talk, and it also mentioned uh, doing things in a manner that does not threaten food production, recognising that we are a growing population in the world that, that also need to be fed. And in the Paris Agreement, countries are called upon to make what are called nationally determined contributions, or voluntary, I suppose, statements as to what they're going to do towards the goal of um, keeping temperature rise below uh, an absolute max of 2 degrees and hopefully below 1.5. Another body just want to mention, because while we're going through all the jargon of this, uh, the International Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, this is another intergovernmental body, again, uh, under the auspices of the United Nations, and its job is to provide the scientific uh, information relevant to the whole topic of climate change. That was founded in 1988. One of the, the big outputs of that is that it produces regular assessment reports, or ARs as they're called. We've had five of those to date, uh, the last, the fifth assessment report, AR5, was completed in 2014 and the next is due in 2022. Um, it also produces special reports, so it produced a report in 2018 about keeping temperature rise down to this 1.5 degree and it produced special reports on land and oceans uh, as well. So, starting to bring all that, you know, um, infrastructure back home. So how does the EU deal with, with all of this? Because as you know, we're, we're very much part of the EU. And what happens basically is that the EU uh, signs up and agrees to the overall greenhouse gas reduction target for the EU as a whole. And then it apportions that out to the countries of the EU in what's called an effort sharing agreement. All very nice euphemisms for, for um, tackling this problem. So we all have to share the effort uh, that's involved in this. Um, so the, the first, uh, in the first effort sharing agreement, uh, the EU separated out energy generation and large industry. And it said, that's going to be part of an emissions trading scheme and we'll deal with you over there and across all the, the countries of the EU. And what's left then, what's in the non-emissions trading scheme is agriculture, transport, housing and other industry. So that's what has to be dealt with by each country at a national level. And just to give you an example of the effort sharing agreement, the one that we're, we're currently in, the, the second commitment period for Kyoto, the Irish target or the Irish effort share in that is to reduce our emissions by 20% by 2020 compared to 2005. So just to look at how we have been doing, and I won't go into this in much detail because John has, has, has also showed this, but um, that is how our emissions should have been going uh, over the last uh, eight years if we were to reach our commitments in the second phase of Kyoto. That is how they've actually gone. So you can see that for the first couple of years we were well on target, we were actually below the emissions trajectory, but as the economy recovered our emissions started to rise again and so we're now well above that trajectory. So on the whole, for the commitment period of the eight years, we will on balance be, be over our emissions. And I suppose most worryingly, as John, had, uh, uh, sorry, as John pointed out, we're on the wrong pathway uh, rather than, you know, we're, we're diverging away from where the target. The next effort sharing agreement covers the next decade. So this is the Paris Agreement uh, side now implementing that. And uh, the first thing is you can see that's, that's our trajectory, what we should be on for the Paris Agreement for the next decade. We've, we've got the, the baseline back up, we're st or the starting point back up, I guess. Uh, but, you know, it still is a long way from where our emissions are. And as I said, that's, that's kind of what we've got to get to on that line. This is where we, we should be by 2030. And, um, you know, that's if we keep going the way we're going, where we're going to be. So you can see there's a long, um, a big job to be done in terms of uh, getting those emissions back on, on track. So I suppose that's, that's all the background stuff. So I suppose where, where is this whole issue going uh, from here? What's going to happen? 
you know, we are a small country very much in this. What's happening uh, in the rest of the world? And I suppose, you know, it's a very topsy-turvy place in relation uh, to this issue. Here we have uh, the, the photograph of the, the day that President Trump uh, announced the decision to withdraw, that the US would withdraw from the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, we can see back here at home and internationally, we have a growing climate change movement, uh, you know, which is calling for, for action and quick action and radical action. So, you know, you see a divergence there between the way uh, some countries are approaching this and what people on the, the ground are saying. Uh, we would see, certainly in the debate here in Ireland, I'm sure elsewhere as well, uh, in my view, uh, I guess this is an opinion, that agriculture is often unfairly targeted uh, in terms of um, what its, its contribution to climate change and what should, its role should be uh, in terms of uh, dealing with, with climate change. And then we have issues or things, events like the Australian bushfires. You know, will that be a seminal moment in how countries uh, look at this issue and maybe how they, they uh, galvanise themselves in, in order to deal with it? And on the, the political front, we have a new commission here in Europe, just established, and they have put as their priority uh, the European Green Deal, which is committing Europe or wants to commit Europe to um, becoming carbon neutral continent uh, by 2050, which is, is going to require a lot of ambition and a lot of uh, action uh, uh, to achieve that. Just looking at some other countries around the world and how they're uh, dealing with this, you know, we're, we're, I suppose, bought into the European thing. We're, we're part of the, these effort sharing agreements in the EU. A country like New Zealand isn't. It, it creates its own uh, climate policy. It's a very country similar to ourselves in terms of a, the high importance of agriculture. So it's interesting to see what, what they're doing in this regard. And they're, uh, well, they're currently, I suppose, debating uh, their climate policy for the next uh, 30 years. And the proposals are that they will reduce emissions of all greenhouse gases except methane to net zero by 2050. Uh, they will reduce emissions of methane by some percentage, and they've given a, the, 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 the proposals give a range between 24 and 47 percent uh, below 2017 levels. And I suppose the, the, the reason for that separation of methane from the others is this issue that uh, we, we hear a lot about, the short-lived nature of methane in the atmosphere, is why they are, they are separating out those. And that certainly is going to get a lot of attention uh, in scientific circles over, over the coming years. Here in Ireland, uh, our policy um, has clarified very much in the last year, and we've had the, the government's climate action plan uh, published in 2019. And... Um, for the first time, uh, that, that set down individual targets for individual sectors as to the contribution that they would make towards Ireland coming back on track uh, for, for this um, uh, 2030 period. And, and John ha has alluded uh, to this. Currently, uh, the agriculture part of that, uh, framed in the, in the plan called Ag Climatize, uh, is, is out for consultation by the Department of, of Agriculture as to how agriculture will implement or tackle uh, th this issue. So the targets in that Climate Action Plan for Agriculture are that um, we will reduce emissions from a level in 2017 of about 20 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent and a projected level, if we do nothing, in 2030 of about 21 million tonnes. We will reduce that back to uh, a range of 17.5 to 19 million tonnes. So it's requiring an absolute reduction um, in the emissions from the sector, not just an improvement in the footprint, which we've been really good at achieving uh, over the last uh, num number of decades. Um, that, that is very useful and very important, but the, the Climate Action Plan uh, has a, a target range there of 17.5 uh, to 19 million tonnes of carbon. So the question, obviously, is can we meet uh, the target? And... Um, you know, it depends really on three things. There's three big drivers uh, for for our emissions and for our ability to meet that target. There's obviously cattle numbers, there's nitrogen fertiliser use, and there's the adoption of mitigation technologies. And cattle numbers gets a, a huge focus, and, and John, I, in your presentation, you, you put the challenge very clearly, you know, that uh, a reduction in cattle numbers uh, you see as, as maybe part of the solution. I suppose my thesis is that we can achieve the reductions that are called for in the Climate Action Plan without the need to to uh, reduce the cattle herd. The cattle herd is one of the most talked about, but one of the 
uh, very often inaccurately by people. The, the Irish cattle herd has remained relatively stable for the last uh, three years or so. People, you would think that um, there's a mushrooming of the cattle herd uh, according to some comments that you hear. Certainly there's been a change within the cattle herd. The dairy herd, the size of the dairy herd has increased by about 40%, 40% but ch other changes in the herd have meant that the overall herd is about the, about the same size. The trends for that, you know, it's a big driver of, of our emissions. What do we think is going to happen? Well, look, we don't know. There certainly is a continuing trend uh, or, or a demand, really, for people to, to move into more profitable dairying. Um, but they, as I said, the numbers for the last couple of years have more or less stabilised because of changes in the, in the size of the beef cow herd. Nitrogen fertiliser follows, uh, follows the cattle herd. The more cattle we have, the more fertiliser in general that we use uh, to grow it. And within that, the more dairy cows tend to be more fertiliser heavy users. So that is something that um, we obviously need to, to get, a, uh, you know, to make sure that we're using as much as we need, but as little, uh, but not to be wasting. And I'll come back to that in a lot of detail in a minute. But the third big thing, and the, the action, I suppose, point, and my, my talk was from calculations to action. The action point really is, what can we do to mitigate the emissions? Okay, apart from the, the big drivers of animal numbers and, and fertilizer use. And we in Chagas um, have uh, assessed all the mitigation options that are available uh, to farmers. I'm not going to go through them in all detail because, you know, there's, if we'd want a, an hour or two to, um, I suppose, to give justice to that. But we've, we've assessed all the mitigation options and there's about 26 or 7 things that can be done on farms or with land use that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We've put them into kind of three groupings and I'm only going to talk a little bit about the first grouping. The first grouping is mitigation pathways where we try to reduce the emissions of methane or nitrous oxide uh, from our farms. The second pathway is about sequestration and that's a very important part in particular now with the, the next decade because Ireland is allowed use uh, two, about 2.5 two million tonnes or 2.6 million tonnes of carbon offsets or sequestration every year for the, the next decade. So that's uh, a very important uh, mitigation pathway and very much built into what agriculture will do in the Climate Action Plan. And the third pathway, which I won't talk about uh, today, is around energy and the contribution that agriculture can make, first of all in terms of reducing energy usage on farms, but also contributing to renewable energy uh, supply in, in the country. So basically, I, I, and again in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this MAC curve as it's called, marginal abatement cost curve, in any detail. But really it's a, a fancy kind of a way to draw a graph to show you all the things that can be done. And each, um, each of these things that you unfortunately have to turn your head sideways to read, that's a mitigation option. So just to pull out a few, breeding better animals is something that reduces the uh, emissions per kilogram of product. Uh, fertilizer type, the, the type of fertilizer is a big emitter of nitrous oxide. Uh, if we change the fertilizer type, we can tackle a lot of that, and so on. So there's a number of, of mitigation options uh, in there. There's three of them that I want to pull out that really have to look at the, the whole nitrous oxide side. Can we reduce these emissions from nitrogen fertilizer? I'll talk about the animal uh, in, in a minute. And there's three technologies that are really important in this. The first, fertilizer type. Um, urea as a fertilizer has lower nitrous oxide emissions. Nitrous oxide is one of the greenhouse gases. So urea has low, lower nitrous oxide emissions than the other form of nitrogen, calcium ammonium nit nitrate. It does, unfortunately, urea have higher ammonia emissions, which is another gas we have to worry about. Protected urea has low emissions of both, and that's why it's in our MAC curve as a very, um, as a very important measure for reducing the absolute emissions from the agricultural sector. It's actually cheaper on a per unit of nitrogen basis than can. So it's one of these measures that John refers to where you can, uh, you can reduce emissions and actually bring about a cost saving on, on farms as well. The second one I want to mention, again around nitrogen, is slurry. And slurry is a very, very valuable resource on farms, contains a lot of nutrients. So the first thing with slurry is that you, you try to maximize the nitrogen fertilizer replacement value from it. In other words, you, you, you use your slurry to reduce your fertilizer bill. Two ways to do that, apply the slurry when it's most likely to be used for, for grass growth or plant growth, that's in the springtime, so apply as much of the slurry in the springtime as you can. And second step then along that is to use a slurry spreading technology that again reduces the emissions uh, of nitrogen from the slurry. Because look, if the nitrogen is going up in the air, uh, it's not available to the plant for growth. So using technologies like the trailing shoe or the trailing hose 
are, uh, again, big advantages uh, from the point of view of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The third one is an old one that's been around for a long time, and that's clover. And adding clover to pastures uh, can save up to 100 kilos of nitrogen in a, a, high, a high stocking rate system. So that 100 kilos of nitrogen is emissions saved or emissions avoided. So clover, uh, which can be a difficult uh, crop to manage in, a, in grassland, but it is, again, very much part and parcel of the strategy to, to tackle our, our emissions of nitrous oxide. We have um, encapsulated the, the things that farmers um, can do uh, around not just climate change, but into all the sustainability uh, issues or the environmental sustainability issues uh, that we meet in our farms, that greenhouse gases, ammonia, water quality, biodiversity. And I won't go through them in detail, but this leaf, um, the first one is improving your EBI and extending the grazing season. So that's a summary point for more efficient uh, and, and, and better farming. Substituting clover, as I've just mentioned, for fertilizer nitrogen, changing to protected urea, reducing losses from slurry, um, improved energy efficiency and renewable energy on farms, incorporating forestry and hedgerows on farms, and using the asset advisors to help uh, improve water quality. So there's none of those very radical measures, uh, but together they can make a huge uh, difference um, on our farms in terms of this issue of climate change, but also the other uh, environmental sustainability issues that we are concerned about uh, today. What's our role? Um, I suppose the, uh, our role to date has been that um, our research encapsulated in that back curve that I showed you has given us the basis of a plan. You know, that, has, that has allowed the sector at least have a plan for what it is going to do uh, to, to, to fulfil what's asked of it in the, in the Climate Action Plan. The need now is to turn that plan into reality. I think it was, um, Frank might remember one of the, the former US presidents, Dwight Eisenhower, who said that agriculture is very easy when your pen is a plough and when you live a thousand miles from the field. So in other words, very easy to write a plan. It's another job to go out and implement it. So the challenge now is about implementing the MAC. That's the immediate challenge. And I wouldn't underestimate the importance of early implementation of that. And, you know, we, Frank, or John showed and I showed the trajectory of emissions at the moment, and it's all bad news. Emissions up again, emissions up again. The sooner we can uh, have a year where agriculture and Irish emissions are falling, uh, I think it will, it will give people heart in this debate and show that, uh, show that there is a way out uh, and, uh, of, of the issue. So we're going to uh, have a slide in a second about our advisory campaign uh, around this issue, the, the signpost farm campaign. And the third role that we have then is we need to go beyond the MAC. We need to be thinking beyond the MAC. The MAC is the measures that are there now, but we're going to need additional and further measures for the future because, you know, the Green Deal sets out clearly Europe, is, Europe wants to be a carbon neutral uh, continent. So what are we going to look at in relation to that? Well, carbon sequestration has been mentioned. We need a lot of research on that uh, in the, in, over the, the coming 10 years uh, before we get to the, the post-2030 period. We need new technologies for methane. Our biggest single uh, greenhouse gas in agriculture is methane. It's about two-thirds of the total emissions from agriculture. And as yet, apart from improving efficiency and breeding, we have no real technology uh, that tackles the methane part of the emissions. All the technologies that I talked about are focused on the fertiliser or nitrogen part. The good news is that there is a pipeline of technologies coming uh, that at least have, the, have promise in terms of tackling uh, that methane issue. And the, the, the third part of our research beyond the MAC is going to continue to focus on the nitrogen uh, side of the equation because while we, we can see good progress or good opportunities to make progress, there are further opportunities, uh, we believe, in relation to nitrous oxide uh, emissions as well. So our signpost farm programme, what is that? Well, it's going to be a knowledge transfer campaign to bring about change in relation to the implementation of the issues in, in the MAC. And I suppose we want to uh, we want to turn the sign away from, you know, all the uncertainty that, that's over the, the sector at the moment. You know, what's it going to have to do? Will the cattle herd have to be reduced? Will we all have to stop eating meat? Will all this happen, you know? And we want to turn the signpost into a way that uh, people can see, yes, if we farm in a climate smart way, uh, this is how agriculture is going, to, uh, is going to develop for the future. So the campaign, uh, the centre point of it is a, 
a, a number, and probably somewhere, and I say a number, it's, it's you know, maybe 80, 90, 100 uh, demo farms, dairy beef sheep farms around the country that are our, our signpost farms. These are the, the farms where we implement the measures very carefully and closely and have all the data that we can show what the emissions reduction is. And we use those farms as the, you know, sometimes people say the poster boy farms or whatever, as to how the sector uh, can develop this uh, and, and use those technologies in, in the map. Obviously, producing a sustainability roadmap for our farms is very important. People need to know, well, what should I be doing? It needs to be kind of laid out, this is what I might do in year one, this is what I might do in year two, and so on. And then, what's the impact of that? Follow that through to, to measure what happens. We, the, the, the channels then in which we communicate to people, obviously discussion groups are hugely important, the events that we organise, uh, very important, and the training of our own staff and all the other people that interact with farmers is going to be a central uh, part of this, uh, this uh, campaign. And, okay, we can do a lot in Chagask, uh, but we, you know, we're, we're not the only boys in town or the girls in town, and I suppose, you know, the... Uh, the, the other, some of the other drivers that are going to impact on this are the retailers and consumers. And we should never lose sight of that, you know, that while this is very much a kind of a, a top-down sort of a thing, you know, the United Nations, governments and so on and policies and all that saying you have to do this and you have to do that. The other side of it is the consumer. And we've all seen the kind of way consumers and, and uh, people are exercised about this. And we have to sell our food our products to these consumers. So we have to be very, very cognizant of what they want uh, us to do and that they see that the sector is, is uh, taking responsible action. Obviously, the new common agriculture policy and regulation in this area uh, will be important as well. So to summarize, climate change has been an issue for over 30 years now and, and even longer th than that. And you know, if, it's certainly not going away. And if anything, over the last couple of years, the debate is intensifying. Sometimes you think these things run their course and, you know, the agenda moves on, but the agenda is not moving on uh, from this. The science is still developing. You know, there, there are a lot, there's a lot happening on the, the scientific side in, the, in, in, in this area. And, you know, it is important that Ireland has strong capability and can participate, even though we're a small country. You know, we do need to be active uh, both nationally and internationally in this area. I think what's really important is that it's a balanced approach. You know, people that are saying agriculture is over, as we know it, you know, that's not a balanced approach. Uh, neither is saying agriculture has nothing to do. You know, we leave agriculture out of all this. That's not a balanced approach. We need a balanced approach, and I think with a balanced approach, uh, we actually can make a huge contribution uh, in, in this area. I think agriculture can reach the targets in the, in the government uh, climate action plan if the key mitigation act actions are adopted and, and adopted early, and that that can be done with the same or even a slightly increased uh, cattle herd. The projections that we, we did um, uh, on which the, the, our scenarios were based actually showed a, a very minor, uh, I suppose, increase in the cattle herd. Obviously, a rebalancing uh, between dairy and beef within that herd over the next 10 years. But that's the challenge, John, that you're putting to us, you know, that um, can, we do, can we do this? Can we reach those targets in the Climate Action Plan without the need for a cut in emissions? And look, the, the, the pathway is there to do that, but we have to go and do it. Uh, we have to implement the measures. So uh, the job now, as I said, is to impl implement the MAC and obviously to keep our eye on the future and you know, not reach 2030 and say, geez, job well done, and realise that we have another, two more mountains to climb and we haven't been preparing for those. We need to be preparing for the post-2030 uh, period now for the next, next decade. So thank you very much, uh, and sorry if I went on a little bit long.